chapter of the Bible. Revelation chapter 21. Now I realize you've already had a big dose of me today. And unfortunately, there's another big spoonful coming. I am glad that Ken and Stephanie uh, had an opportunity to take a break this week. But we look forward to their return and we'll begin our study through Genesis next week. So today we're looking at a very comforting and hopeful passage that reminds us of what the destination is of this faith journey and as followers of Christ. Revelation 21, would you stand as we read from God's word? Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God And he will be my son. You may be seated. So we come off of last week celebrating the climax of God's redemptive plan for sinful man with the resurrection of Jesus. All of Christianity hinges on that great event. The divine plan that was prophesied for thousands of years has been fulfilled. Jesus even cried from the cross... It is finished. And with that cry, and with the resurrection, and the ascension, the penalty for sin had been forgiven, and our eternal hope of heaven has been provided. As important and as as monumental and as miraculous as that event was, there is still to come a biblical prophecy that is yet to be fulfilled. An event that will be the final move of the divine plan of this age. The second coming of Christ and the ushering in of a new heaven and a new earth. Since the fall of man in the garden when sin entered the world, mankind has been yearning for a savior. Throughout the stories of the Old Testament, God's people had longed for his presence with them. To guide them, to comfort them, and to protect them. They waited expectantly and eagerly for the Messiah to come. After the death and the resurrection and the ascension of the Messiah, the apostles, the many disciples, and the early church eagerly anticipated the return of Christ. You can see in the New Testament, you can see in the stories and the teachings that they lived and worked and ministered and prayed and believed with great anticipation of Christ's return and the promise of heaven. Through the centuries, believers could say with the psalmist in Psalm 73, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee, I desire nothing on earth. That is the expression of the heart that longs for God. Much like Psalm 42, where the psalmist says, As the deer pants after the water brook, So pants my soul after thee, O God. Being consumed with the person of God, longing to be in the presence of God, was on the heart of the early church. In fact, 
the pure in heart, according to the words of Jesus in the Beatitudes, will someday see God. Through the centuries, that desire to see God, to be in God's presence, to enjoy God forever, believing that there is nothing in this world that can satisfy, has been on the hearts of God's children. It's not so true in our culture. Not in this society that we live in. We are living in a society of instant gratification, material comfort, and endless indulgences. And the church has become worldly. We are addicted to the world and addicted to worldly things. Nothing demonstrates that any more clearly than the believer's lack of interest in heaven. Most Christians are, to some degree, more interested in laying up treasures on earth rather than heaven. They're more concerned with their investments or their retirement package, their own future on earth, than they are with heaven. We don't talk about heaven much. We don't sing about heaven much. Because maybe we're really not that interested in heaven right now in our lives. There's a story of a preacher. It's probably not true, so take it for what it's worth. That asked his congregation one morning, How many of you want to go to heaven? They all raised their hands except for one man sitting in the back. It's always the guy sitting in the back, right? And he says, sir, you don't want to go to heaven? And the guy said, well, yeah, I want to go there. I just thought you were getting the crowd to go now. I mean, I hate to say it. That's kind of our attitude toward heaven, isn't it? We want to go. But do we want to go right now? So the question this morning is, why not? We look at Colossians 3 where it says, Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. 1 John 2, 15, where it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of God, but is of the world. And the world passes away. Or we could even read in the passage where James, where James says, Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Enmity means hostility or hatred. You see, everything connected to our spiritual life and destiny is in heaven. Our Father is there. Our Savior is there. Our Comforter is there. Our fellow believers are there. Our name is there. Our life is there. Our inheritance is there. Our home is there. Our citizenship is there. Our reward is there. Our treasure is there. Everything that belongs to us is there. Consequently, Paul told the Romans that they should be rejoicing in hope. The closer that they are to heaven, the more joy they should experience. These are good words for us today. I see even mature Christians close to heaven trying to hang on to this life. Faithful saints on their deathbeds desperately clinging to this life. Why is this true? Is it because we have not set our minds on things above? Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 1 and 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In other words, we are to live in the constant awareness that we are citizens of another age. We are to set our minds on that age. We are not to be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the renewing means being consumed, being conformed to the newness of the age to come. 
because God says in our next in our text for today, look at verse five. Behold, I will make all things new. When you plan a family vacation to the beach, this is especially true when you have small children involved. You plan a trip months in advance. You have family meetings and talk about what activities you'll enjoy while you're there. You talk about it every day with anticipation and with joy. You dream about it at night. You talk to your friends and your family about it. It totally and completely consumes you. And on that day, it doesn't matter if the actual trip is 2 hours or 12 hours. There is nothing like that day when you finally leave. Enjoying the journey, but anticipating the arrival. Because it is close. You can't wait to get there. You can't wait to get the first glimpse of the ocean. When you see it, you know you are there. The reason we should be longing for heaven is because God is there. And whom have we in heaven but him? And whom do we desire on earth but him? He should be our supreme affection, our supreme love, our supreme desire. And if he is in heaven, then heaven should be the place we constantly long to be. The preacher in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 cynically says this. He says, the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Now, regardless of how he meant that statement, it happens to be true for Christians. To die for a believer is to enter into a better place than the place our birth ushered us into. The Apostle Paul understood this well when he said, for me to live is Christ and for me to die is gain. I say this often in funeral sermons. The believer should not fear death. Death is not the end of the story. It is the beginning of the story. Death for a believer is only a gateway. It's only an entrance into the glorious promise written here in, in Revelation 21 and 22. James says that this earthly life is like a vapor or a flash in the pan when it's compared to eternity. When we ponder the greatness of the age to come, and consider that we will spend eternity there and not our average 80 years or so that we may live here, it changes the way we live in this current age. Romans 6, 5. If we have been, re if we have been united with Christ in death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. What does that mean? The person who knows that his destiny is glorious and certain will be free to live the most radical life of love and sacrifice here on earth. John Piper gives this illustration. If someone falls out of an airplane with no parachute on and you don't have one either, you aren't going to jump after them. It wouldn't do any good. But if you have a parachute on, you just might try one of those awesome rescue attempts and, and free fall like a bullet to catch the helpless and pull your cord. It's the hope of safety in the end that releases radical, sacrificial love now. Piper goes on to quote Colossians 1, 4 and 5. We have heard of the love that we have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. He continues, it's the assurance of the hope of heaven that releases the radical risk-taking love that makes people look at your life and ask a reason for the hope that is in you. What do those people see when they ask you that? They see you jumping out of an airplane to save another person. So they say, how can you jump out of the comfort and safety of this airplane? And you answer, I have a parachute called the hope of glory. End quote. Can you just for a moment imagine 
how living a reality of the promise of heaven and allowing that to overwhelm you and consume you every day in every moment. Can you imagine how that would dramatically change the way you live, the way you serve, the way you minister, the way you love? Can you imagine how radically that would change the way you live? For the sake of the gospel, you would be more bold. You would take more risks. You would not crave the approval and the acceptance of society or man. You would minister and evangelize outside of your comfort level, beyond your abilities, beyond your talents, and beyond your finances. Why? Because you have a parachute called the hope of glory. John MacArthur adds this, when you want to find an evidence of genuine salvation in someone's life, and when you want to find a motive or incentive to the highest excellence of Christian virtue, and when you're looking for someone who has true joy, someone who can stand against temptation, someone who maintains the vigor and diligence of sacrificial of, of spiritual service, someone who honors God above everything else, and someone who wants to repay God for his goodness, you're going to find somebody whose heart is in heaven. The noblest of all Christians, the godliest of all saints, the most virtuous of all believers are going to be heavenly minded and they're going to live in the life of eternity. So when we talk about heaven in the book of Revelation, we're not just talking about pie in the sky. We're talking about something that has immense implications on how we live our lives. The supreme purpose of God for creation and for his people will not be complete until all things are made new and the glory of the Lord fills them. Look at verse 5. God says, Behold, I will make all things new. And he reinforces that certainty in two ways. He's sitting on his throne when he says it, the throne of the universe. He who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And after he said it, he added, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. So God wants us to read this and to be sure of this. He wants us to have assurance that no matter how much evil and suffering and futility we see now, he will make all things new. Let's look at four ways that newness is coming. First, God is going to make us spiritually and morally new and glorious. The greatest frustration of this age is that we still sin. I believe Romans 7 describes this well in verses 23 and 24. Paul says, I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see my members another law at war with the law of my mind. The war is the most frustrating thing about life in this age at least for believers. We want to be holy, and we fall short of that holiness that we long for. We want to love, and yet we say hurtful things. We want to worship, and we often feel so cold. We want to walk in peace. We feel anxiety. We want to be pure in thought, thought and impurity bombards our minds. Yes, the Spirit is here to help us in our weakness. But what we long for is deliverance from this bent to sinning. That's what God promises when he makes all things new. We will be made spiritually and morally new. Not just partially as now, but wholly. Look back at verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. This is the picture of the church prepared and beautified for her husband, Jesus Christ. 
when God makes all things new, he will make the church, the people of God, spiritually and morally beautiful for his son. Look at the way that this is described in verses that, that's uh, not on the screen, but is, is uh, just below the passage there if you're looking in your Bible in verse 9 through 11. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Verse 10. And in that spirit he carried me away to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The same image that was in verse 2. Verse 11. Having the glory of God, its radiance like a, a most rare jewel, like jasper, clear as crystal. When God makes the bride ready for the son, the way he does it is by giving us his glory. And this glory will purify us so deeply and so thoroughly that we will be like a rare jewel, clear as crystal. Don't you long for the day when you will be so good and so right and so pure that you will be like a translucent jewel. Nothing hidden. Nothing shameful. Second, God is going to make us physically and bodily new. For whatever reason, maybe the most common thought of heaven, certainly uh, in, in secular world, the most common picture of heaven is that when we die, we become these little chubby babies sitting on clouds and for whatever reason shooting arrows at random places. Or we're, we believe or we're told that we will become angels. Or we believe or we've been told that uh, our bodies won't exist in heaven. We will be uh, disembodied and our, only our spirits will exist there. All of these concepts are, of course, ridiculous. Scripture is not quiet about heaven. And nowhere in Scripture will you find these fantasies. Look at verse 4. I think this gives us an indication of what our physical state will look like. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, or crying, nor pain, nor any more. For the former things have passed away. No more death. No more pain. No more tears. What that means is that this body that we know will be changed. It has to change because it dies. And it hurts. And it cries. If death is gone and pain is gone and tears are gone, then the body as we know it is gone. It has to be made new. Paul put it like this in Philippians uh, 3.20. Our commonwealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change the body of our lowliness to be like the body of his glory, according to the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself. He says nearly the same thing in Romans 6. We shall certainly be united to him in resurrection like his it is a new body it will never die again it will never hurt again it will never cry sorrowfully again and third god is going to make the creation new and glorious going to make all of creation new and glorious this is the point of verse one then i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. There will be a new earth because this earth dies. We live on a temporary planet. It will die, and it has been dying since Adam and Eve were removed from the garden. This is going to maybe sound like a political statement, and I certainly don't mean for it to be, and, and in my mind it is not. 
But climate change is real. The planet is dying. And just like our bodies, the more we age, the more our reality changes, and the faster the deterioration and the, the decay happens. With that said, let me add this. We cannot stop God's sovereign plan. He is telling us very clearly that the earth will pass away. There is nothing we can do to prevent it from happening any more than we can prevent our loved ones or ourselves from dying. Paul put it like this in Romans 8, 21. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the liberty of the glory of the children of God. The newness and the glory of the church, the children of God, is the primary first recreation. But then God promises that the glory of his people will demand a glorious creation to live in. So the fallen creation will obtain the very freedom from futility and evil and pain that the church will be given. So there's coming a new heaven and a new earth. But I am saying the idea of preserving this world runs contrary to God's plan. This earth is dying. It is unraveling. It is declining. It is winding down. And consequently, God does not intend for it to remain. The goals of all those who desperately invest their passion and their time and their resources to save the earth are ultimately laboring in vain because this planet will be replaced by an eternal new heaven and new earth. Listen, all the way back in, in the book of Psalm, Psalm 102, it says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe. And they will pass away. That verse is almost uh, identically quoted in Hebrews uh, chapter 1. And even Jesus says this in Luke 21. Heaven and earth will pass away. When God makes all things new, he makes us spiritually and morally new. He makes us new physically. Then he makes the whole creation new so that our environment fits our perfected spirits and bodies. That leaves one final work of renewing when God makes all things new. God will make our relationship with him new and glorious. John tells us in verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them. It's true that God is with us now. His spirit dwells with us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Jesus promised never to leave us uh, until the end of this age. Matthew 28, 20. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, Paul says... While we are at home in the body, we are what? Away from the Lord. For here we walk by faith and not by sight. So there is a deep and painful sense in which we are away from the Lord. We do not see as we will one day. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus said, for they shall see God. It's a promise. Something greater is coming for all of us in our relationship with God. Piper says again, how many times will a little child say what we all really feel? Daddy, I want to believe, but I can't see him. You ever said that? That's a real heart cry. That we should never lose. We should long to see him. Revelation 22, 4 gives us the answer. They shall see his face. 
and his name shall be on their forehead. When God makes all things new, he will make us spiritually and morally as pure and as flawless crystal. He will give us a body like the body of his glory. He will renovate all creation and take all futility and evil and pain out of it. And finally, he himself will come to us and let us see his face. And so forever and ever, we will live with pure hearts and glorious bodies on a new earth in the presence and the glory of our heavenly Father. Why do we not long for that? What on this earth could possibly be of any comparison? You and I have seen some beautiful places. We've been to some beautiful places in this world. We have experienced great joy in our lifetimes. But can you imagine, just for a moment, what fullness of joy is in every moment of every day, forever? Can you imagine the beauty of, pick your place, Hawaii, the Caribbean, the Swiss Alps? Can you even imagine what they will look like in an uncursed world? I said that Scripture is not quiet about heaven. It makes us, it makes, or it gives us many stunning and remarkable details. Danny Aiken provides a summary of just the verses in in, uh, Revelation 21 and 22. Twelve sure promises that are revealed. God makes a new heaven and an earth in Jerusalem. Chaos and disorder are no more. God will live with his people personally. The effects of sin are eradicated and done away with. All the legitimate desires of our heart will be satisfied. Our inheritance of heavenly blessings will be plentiful and permanent. The splendor of the new Jerusalem will be magnificent. The glory of God will permeate our dwelling place. Nations will be guided by God. Protections and peace are perfectly present. Productivity will be bountiful and breathtaking. Perpetual, perfect service will be our calling. God says, write this down because these words are faithful and true. Then I love this in verse 6. God says, it is done. It is finished. It is complete. And we can say this, the sovereign God and the ruler of the universe is the only person that can say that, the Alpha and the Omega. Now, in order for me to be faithful to this passage, I can't end today without having us read verse 8. Guys, this is on the screen. I've spent all of my time This morning reminding believers of the promise and the hope of heaven. There is a flip side to this promise. And it is directed to those who do not believe. Those who are who have not surrendered their lives to Christ. For those. This is the promise. Look at verse eight. But as for the cowardly. The faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. Listen, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. God provides here a selective but not exhaustive list of persons who will not be in heaven. It's another kind of worldly myth that goes around that in the end we're all going to end up in the same place. 
there's eight specific sins are noted that characterize the lives of those who will not spend their eternity in heaven, but will instead spend their eternity in this this uh, lake that burns with fire and sulfur. First, the cowards are individuals who, because of fear, will not confess Christ openly when confronted with persecution. The unbelievers or the faithless are those who deny Christ by their conduct and speech. The vile or the detestable are those polluted by gross acts of idolatry. Murderers are malicious, savage killers. Sexual, immoral people are the ones who lived sexual lifestyles contrary to God's plan and purpose. Sorcerers are those who mix drugs with the practices of spirit worship witchcraft, and magic. Idolaters are worshipers of idols and images. All liars are those who habitually deceive others. None of these people have access to the New Jerusalem. They will spend their eternity in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Listen, and please listen carefully. There is no in-between. This is where common grace ends. Not everyone will see this new heaven and this new earth. There will be judgment for those that do not believe. And it will be swift and it will be terrible. God's great mercy and patience will end for those that choose their own way. I said earlier that believers should not fear death. But for the unbeliever, death is terrifying. The good news is, God is still merciful and patient now. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross for the forgiveness of sins is still available to you today. But time is drawing near and the day of judgment is coming. A decision to surrender your life to Christ is urgent. Do it today. Do it now. The final chapter of Revelation, the final chapter of the Bible Jesus speaks three times. And he says, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. I am coming soon. And as believers, we should say, come Lord Jesus. Quickly come. Let's pray. Father, we are here because of your goodness, because of your grace, because of your mercy. We stand in your presence, not because of anything we were able to bring to our salvation, but we come in full acknowledgement and full humbleness in the fact that you provided it all. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be faithful, that you would help us to to be eagerly seeking the things that are above. That you, Lord, you would release us individually to live with the hope of heaven. Lord, help us as a church not to claim our resources and invest them in earthly things. Help us as a church, corporately, as your people, to be heavenly minded. To teach the next generations how to, how to set our minds on things above. And how to minister and how to function and how to love in that posture. 
Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the cross and the resurrection. We thank you for uh, making a way for us to come to you. And then, Lord, as we come to the end of your word, we thank you that you are sitting on the throne and you have a great divine plan for your children. Lord, help us to eagerly anticipate that daily. Bless us today. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.